That song uh, is called Revelation Song. We just sang. Because the words are taken right out of the book of Revelation. You didn't know, perhaps some of you, that you're singing the words that we're told the angels are singing around the throne right now, and that all creation is singing, and one day all creation, all people will sing before the Lord Almighty. Every time I sing that song, I think about we're joining with a song that's always going on in God's presence. And I remember Elizabeth, reading Elizabeth Elliot once said, a rock or a clam glorifies God better than you. Meaning a rock or clam is living according to its created purpose, is doing what it was made to do. You and I have a choice in the matter. And we don't always live the way we're made to live or do what we're made to do, which is to bring glory and honor to God. But it's good to come together today and do that. Let's bow in prayer. You are holy and almighty. And we do join our voices in this moment with all creation and declare that you alone are king. We, we know that we're in your presence. We know that your word is living and active and speaks to us. So we're asking you, Jesus, to clear away whatever might be in, in, in the way of our minds or our hearts to, that might prevent us from hearing what you want to say. We pray this in your name. Amen. We are picking back up in our series called Following the King. One of our staff members jokingly said this week in the office, does that mean we weren't following the king the last several months? No, of course, we're always following Jesus. But we did take a break for our Advent series, and then during the month of January, if you've been with us, we did a series called Questioning God, asking questions about God's existence, his goodness, uh, his purpose and plan uh, from the book of Psalms, because the Psalms themselves ask questions of God. Last week, Pastor Brian wrapped up the series with this sermon from Psalm 24, Who is this King of Glory? And his name is Jesus. And the only right response for knowing who he is is to follow him. So it makes sense that we're back in our series called Following the King. I don't, there are moments in life uh, that, that, I don't know if, about you, but sometimes I look, back at, I look back at my life and realize that was a significant moment. I didn't see it then, but I get it now. That was a big deal. Are you like that? You see the most important moments often in hindsight? Well, sometimes there are moments in life that come to us and, and we miss them. I remember talking to a friend of mine, uh, that I, who's a, he's a missionary in Libya, and it's illegal to do public evangelism uh, to talk about Jesus or the gospel publicly in Libya. He's a, so he does, a, he does business leadership principles based on the leadership uh, principles of Jesus. And he tries to build friendships and share the gospel with people privately. Some Muslim men in Libya found out about that he was a Christian and invited him to dinner. They wanted to hear about Jesus. And he'd heard that at times there can be sort of these uh, false invitations, which are tricks actually, to get you arrested for proselytizing. So he was nervous. Should I go? And if I go, should I share the gospel? I mean, I'm, what if I get arrested? What if it, they come from my family? This is, he was very nervous about this and was praying about it. And he had an elder in his church say to him, this might be the only opportunity that you have with these men. And it might be the only moment they ever hear the gospel. Don't waste it. And so he did, and God used it mightily. In large and small ways, I think sometimes moments come to us that, that are significant, and we can miss them. Who knows? There might be a moment for some of you here this morning, some of you watching online or some of you in this room. There might be a moment God has something for you. Don't let it pass you by. The story we're going to look at from Mark chapter 10 is a story about a man who had a moment where he met Jesus and he was never the same. Literally Jesus passing by and he would not let that moment miss him. And God did something remarkable. And I believe he wants to do the same thing in our day today. Let's look at Mark 10 verses 46 through 52. And they came to Jericho and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples in a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, take heart, get up, he's calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. This is the last of the miracles, healing miracles in Mark's gospel before we get to the resurrection. 
There's a series of miracles. Mark records fewer of them than Luke and, John, uh, and, and Matthew and John. But this is the last one recorded. And by the way, this is the only miracle in, in the gospel, the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the only one where we get the name of the person who's healed. Often we'll get the relatives' names, but we don't, it's the only place where we get the, the personal name of the, person, of the individual Jesus healed. I think there's a reason for that we'll come to later. And it is a story of a miracle. A blind man receiving sight. So it's worth asking the question, do you believe in miracles? Do you? I know you're in church, you're supposed to say yes. But really, do you really believe in miracles? I don't mean like 1980 hockey team against Russia in the Olympics. They're not that kind of miracle. I don't mean like great comeback miracles, you know, best parking spot miracle. I don't mean that. I mean the miraculous, unexplainable, had to be God. How did this happen kind of miracle? You ever pray fervently for that kind of miracle and not see it? If we're, if we're honest, there's a part of us that intellectually, yeah, okay, okay, I believe in miracles because I'm a Christian, but I, I, I struggle to, want to really truly believe. Does it happen today? Does God still do that? As many of you know, I'm praying. We, many of us are praying for a miraculous healing of Jenny Caterer, my administrative assistant, dear sister in Christ, and many of you have people you're praying for. Do you believe that could happen? When you read a story like this, do you go, well, that was then. What do we make of it? C.S. Lewis in his book, Miracles, says Christianity is the only of the major world religions that requires belief in miracles. Islam, Hinduism, um, Judaism, of course, to a degree, even Buddhism, they, they have records of the miraculous, but they don't require you to believe that. They're not central to your, the tenets of belief, meaning the to be a Christian means you've got to accept two major ones. The incarnation, God becomes man, and the resurrection, defeat of death and the grave. Without those, there is no Christianity. So as people, as followers of Jesus, it's a question worth asking. Okay, now, a few things about this man uh, who is healed. Bartimaeus is his name. We know his father's name, Timaeus. Bar means son of, and Mark makes that clear. It's kind of redundant in case we didn't know. And he's poor, he's a beggar, and he's blind, he can't see. In the Bible, sight is often connected to um, belief or faith. And therefore, blindness is often connected to lack of faith, unbelief, or spiritual lostness. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, Paul puts it this way. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Spiritual blindness, in other words. How does your mind get blinded? He's talking about the spiritual kind of sight there. We actually see Jesus use the same language talking to his own disciples when they don't understand what he's doing. Two chapters earlier in Mark chapter 8, verses 17 and 18. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes do you not see? Having ears do you not hear? And do you not remember? So hard hearts is connected to blind eyes, spiritually speaking. Jericho in Jesus' day, by the way, where Jesus is leaving Jericho, uh, you might think of Jericho, maybe you grew up watching Veggie Tales, and you know Joshua and the Big Wall story, or Joshua and the Battle of Jericho, you know that story. Old Testament Jericho and New Testament Jericho were a little bit different, they were connected. There was an upper and lower city. Uh, the upper city was on the way up to Jerusalem, because Jericho was below sea level. You had to go up to get to Jerusalem. Uh, it, was, it was a long uh, walk through the mountains. Uh, Upper Jericho, uh, on the way, was where um, Herod the Great, remember Herod the Great? They called him the builder and the butcher in the New Testament. The builder because he built amazing things, but the butcher because he was a brutal dictator. He's the one who wanted to kill all the newborn babies, males, so when Jesus was born to stop the, this king of the Jews who might usurp his power. Anyway, he built a massive summer palace in Upper Jericho, like his, his getaway summer home. And uh, I've seen the ruins of it. So anybody walking from Jericho to Jerusalem had to go from the lower city to the upper city and pass by his palace. That's probably where this blind beggar, Bartimaeus, is sitting by the roadside, a perfect spot with all the merchants coming and going all day to beg. By the way, Jericho, interesting historical note, along with Damascus, are the two oldest continually inhabited, inhabited cities in all the world. Very ancient city called the City of Palms. And there's this blind man there. But he's not the only one without sight, spiritually speaking. 
Interesting to note that in the midst of this encounter between Bartimaeus and Jesus, Jesus asked this question, what do you want me to do for you? Which if you've been tracking with us several months ago when we were in Mark, or one story earlier in Mark chapter 10, Jesus asked the very same question of James and John, two of his disciples. They come to him and they say, we want you to do whatever we ask, which is a really arrogant thing to say. And Jesus goes, what do you want me to do for you? And what do they say? We want to sit at your right and your left. They want positions of status and power and significance. There's an important contrast between how James and John answer that question and how Bartimaeus answers it, which we'll talk about as we go. The story of Bartimaeus gives us a clear picture of faith. He's a contrast to lots of the others who don't see and don't understand who Jesus is. Bartimaeus is like an example to us of what authentic faith really looks like. And I think that's worth pausing over. Think about that for a minute. An example to us of what real faith is, is a blind man begging by the side of the road. Not the intellectual elite, not the religious, uh, important religious people in the world of that day, not the wealthy, not the well-known, not those with a great Twitter following, not the great podcasters or bestsellers or conference speakers or celebrity pastors, but a blind man begging by the side of the road. We know his name today is given to us as a model for real faith. So I want to look at five things from this encounter with Bartimaeus real briefly about real faith, authentic faith. First, faith sees without eyes. That might sound strange. How do you see without eyes? But this is a, a profoundly biblical idea. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says it this way. We walk by faith, not by sight. Clearly not talking about physical sight or you bumping into stuff all the time. We walk by a different kind of spiritual sight. Hebrews 11.1, 1, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Jesus speaking to Thomas, who doubts and says, I won't believe unless I can what? See with my own eyes and touch with my own hands. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Who's he talking about? Who are those who have not seen and yet believed? You, me, us. We walk by faith, not by sight. Faith sees without eyes. You've probably heard the phrase that seeing is believing. Well, not according to the Bible, actually. Believing is seeing with something more than just physical eyes. Paul, in, in the book of Ephesians, says that he prays the eyes of our hearts would be enlightened. So Bartimaeus may be blind, but he sees things about Jesus that many others in this story miss. Second, faith focuses on Jesus. This is the critical distinction to real, genuine, biblical faith. What's the object of it? Where does that faith put its focus and its trust? We hear things today like, just have faith. I remember talking to a friend of mine who was, uh, he was writing his philosophy of coaching. He was a football coach and a really good friend and a good coach. And he was putting together like his, his coaching philosophy. And he had these pillars that it's built on. He said, one of them is faith. I said, that's fantastic. What do you mean by that? Well, you know, I just want our young men to have faith. What do you mean? Faith in each other? Faith in you, the coach? Faith in the game? Faith in themselves? What do you mean by faith? Well, just faith, you know, faith. Listen, just faith is not that much good. Faith in yourself? I mean, I, I know myself too well to put too much faith in myself. I know some of you too well to put too much faith in you, right? <laughs> like, like, I mean, I'm not saying, it's okay. Faith in your fellow, in, in the goodness of humanity. Uh, faith in the process. Just have faith. Listen, a, a, the tiniest bit of faith in Jesus is infinitely better than lots and lots of faith in anyone or anything else. That's why Jesus says, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed. So the point is not how much you muster up, how strongly you feel it, or how much you are convinced of something. The issue is, where is that faith placed? In Jesus. True faith focuses not on self or on the culture or on anything else other than Jesus Christ. We see that here in Blind Bartimaeus' example in his story. Look at verses 46 to 48. And they came to Jericho. We'll have some things to take note of here. And as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples, a great crowd, blind Bartimaeus, a Bar Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out. What did he cry out? And say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. 
That, that simple statement, son of David, have mercy on me, is a profound statement of faith. The son of Timaeus is crying out to the son of David. And when he says son of David, he's using a specific messianic title given to us in the Old Testament in numerous places, particularly 2 Samuel chapter 7, where Jesus, where the Messiah is said, will be of the house and line of David. Sit on the throne of David. So son of David doesn't mean directly like, like his biological son. It means he's from David's lineage. Will sit on David's throne. So when Bartimaeus, who can't see anything, cries out, son of David, he's declaring this is the Messiah. The long-awaited one, the promised one, the great king, the deliverer. And then he says, have mercy on me. In those simple statements, he gets Jesus right and he gets himself right. This is not, a, this is not just a great healer or a good teacher or a, a wise sage or another rabbi. This is the one. This is the Messiah, the king. And he sees himself, what does he say? Have mercy. He sees his desperate need of mercy. Authentic faith recognizes Jesus for who he is and recognizes us, ourselves, for who we are. So this cry out to Jesus is the cry of faith, and you can't really focus on Jesus and yourself at the same time. Jesus, have mercy on me. How would you expect the crowds around to respond to that? How would you expect the crowds, this poor, desperate man, crying out for mercy? Well, you see how they responded. Third aspect, faith perseveres. Faith perseveres and presses on in the midst of opposition and hostility and obstacles. Look at verses 47 to 49. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. Let's pause there for a minute. The crowds are telling him to be silent. They rebuked him. They're saying, don't bother Jesus. They're trying to honor Jesus by keeping the riffraff away, but they totally misunderstand who he is and what he's all about. Trying to prevent him from coming to Jesus, why? What does genuine faith do when it faces opposition? I want you to think about your own life for a minute. When you feel, maybe just internally, your own voices in your head and your heart saying to you, does God really have time for you on this issue again? Are you really gonna bring this? I mean, this seems rather petty. Or you haven't heard the answer you've been looking for. Maybe he's not listening. Or maybe, you, maybe you're just not worthy. Or out externally, maybe there are people in your family, in your business, in your life that are telling you, that's ridiculous what you Christians believe. I mean, come on, really? I mean, isn't religion and Christianity kind of part of the problem in the world today? Maybe you feel oppressed that way. What happens to your faith? What do you do when you feel silenced? By your own heart or by the world around you? I don't know about you, but sometimes if I'm honest, I tend to withdraw, second guess, shrink back. Not Bartimaeus. He what? He cried out all the more. That's worth highlighting in your Bible. He's sitting by the side of the road, he can't see a thing, and he hears that Jesus is coming by, and he cries out, and the crowd tries to keep him quiet, but he won't shut up. This is his moment. There may not be another. And he cries out all the more in desperation. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 36 puts it this way, you must persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. Faith, biblical faith is not how you feel. You can come to worship on a Sunday morning and the song might just hit you right and you feel something. Or you, 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 somebody says an encouraging word to you and you feel uplifted or the sermon isn't terribly boring and you feel uh, sort of inspired or you, know, you, or you have this moment driving your car and you, there are these moments, right? These mountain type moments. Like our middle school students are on a retreat right now. Hopefully they're having great moments with Jesus and moments come and go. But biblical faith it perseveres even in the valleys, even when you don't feel that way, even when it's the opposite. You feel like it's just empty. And you wonder if you're praying to the wall. Biblical faith perseveres.
Fourth, faith moves the heart of Jesus. Faith moves the heart of Jesus. I want you to stop for a minute and do a little experiment with me. If you're watching at home, you can do this as well. I want you to think about Bartimaeus for a moment and what he just did. I want you to close your eyes. I'm guessing with your eyes closed in the room that we're in, there's some light filtering through your eyelids. You still see like the hints of light. So take your hand and put it over your eyes tightly. Did it just get a lot darker? Press your hand against your eyes. And I want you to imagine this is your life. You don't see the face of the people that you love. Your wife, your husband, your son, your daughter, your brother, your sister, mom or dad. You never see a sunrise, a sunset, never see snowfall, never see a mountain view, an ocean, just darkness all the time. And I take your hand away and blink a bit. That's Bartimaeus. Now, often what happens when, when one of the five senses is, is lost, the others get heightened, and it's likely his sense of hearing was sharper than perhaps the average person. So every day he's by the roadside, can't see a thing, darkness but he's listening. He knows the sound of the wagon wheel and the carts as they creak by. He knows the, the sound of merchants and the jingling in their purses as they tramp by. He knows when crowds are coming. He hears a great crowd. That's not the first time, but he hears in the crowd this name being murmured, Jesus of Nazareth. And he's heard that name before. He's heard the stories about his healing miracles, about his teaching. And he thinks, this is the moment. This is my moment. Perhaps part of him is thinking, maybe I'm not worthy. And certainly when the crowd tries to silence him, there's part of, some part of him that's thinking, yeah, why would he have time for me? Why would the king of kings stop for me? But he cries out all the more. He won't stop crying out. In darkness, in blindness, he's crying out to Jesus because he's heard he's coming this way. He may never come this way again. Look at verses 49 to 50. If you've got your Bible and a pen handy, I think this is worth underlining. The first three words, and Jesus stopped. I don't think we can overstate the power of those three words. And Jesus stopped. Think about it. Sometimes we think of Jesus as like a wandering hippie who had nothing to do. Just cruising around, saying wise things, doing random miracles, but he didn't really have like an agenda. Not like us, we got stuff to do, right? That's not true. Nobody had more to accomplish in three years of earthly ministry than Jesus of Nazareth. It's focused. And he stops. In the midst of a crowd, on his way to Jerusalem, he's, and he's, by the way, he's headed to Jerusalem for the triumphal entry. He's headed to Jerusalem for this final week of his life. But he stops. Listen, if, blind, if Jesus stops for a blind guy by the side of the road, he'll stop for you. He'll stop to meet you. And you don't have to be doing great things for God. You don't have to have Bible verses memorized. You don't have to be coming to church a certain length of time. All that is required is that you cry out to him and recognize that he alone is your only help and say, I don't know him much, but I know I need your mercy. I've heard you're merciful. Blind Bartimaeus cry of faith stops the king of kings in his tracks. Isn't that good news? For broken people like us? Oh, we've got the rest of the verse to read. And said, call him. And they called the blind man saying to him, take heart, get up. Isn't that funny how the crowd changes? <laughs> Be quiet. Hey, it's your lucky day, right? He's calling you. <laughs> He's calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. There's a lot in these two verses to examine here. Jesus says, call him, meaning bring him here. And it, I think it's important for us to notice that what's happening to Bartimaeus is he's not initiating, even though it feels like it. God is. In fact, the Bible's clear. If your heart is stirred to call out to God, it's because God is first calling you. He's always the initiator. We are the responders. Whatever's happening in Bartimaeus' heart that maybe, maybe the king would stop for me, that's because the king is already stirring him to do so. Jesus has called him, meaning bring him here. The crowd says, oh, changes its tune. Hey, come on. He's calling you. He's calling you. Think about that. In the midst of a crowd, the most desperate, pitiful creature calls out to Jesus, and Jesus calls him. That means he's calling you too. Don't ever doubt that God has time for you. Don't ever believe he's too busy for you. 
or too distracted or that you're not important enough for him to stop. You simply need to call to him. And Bartimaeus jumps up and hurries to Jesus. That's interesting. He's blind, right? Remember this? Where's he going? I know the general direction of where his voice came from, right? He jumps up and he hurries to Jesus. And there's a detail Mark includes here, which I think is easy to miss, but is important. Mark, Mark writes of all the gospel writers with the fewest words. Nothing's there as by accident. This phrase, and throwing off his cloak, what, uh, first of all, this is probably the most important phrase, he came to Jesus, but on the way he throws off his cloak. What, what, is, what is that about? Was it like hindering him in some way? Was he, was he getting warm? He was just wanted to cool off? Why did, he, why did he throw off his cloak and why does Mark tell us that? A cloak to a poor blind beggar was among the most important things he owned. Think sleeping bag, blanket, seat cushion, pillow, and a windbreaker all rolled into one. In fact, in Exodus 22, there's, a, there's an Old Testament law that if somebody owes you money, you could extract payment, but you could not take a man or woman's cloak as payment because then you leave them vulnerable and defenseless against the elements. So if you're a beggar by the side of the road all day, the cloak's pretty important, but he throws it aside. I think the point is this. Even those things we think are most important to us are not worth anything if they prevent us from coming to Jesus. Now, there's another contrast here. Remember the story of the rich young ruler? Remember that story? Comes to Jesus and Jesus says, one thing you lack, go sell all you have, and give to the poor, then, you, then come follow me. And what does he say? Goes away sad because he had great wealth. He would not throw that off. It's too important to him. But here this blind man, who all he has is this cloak, is willing to cast it aside if it means coming to Jesus. So it's worth us pausing to ask the question of our own hearts. What's your cloak, right? What's the thing maybe that you cling to? That you feel like, well, I, I gotta have this. I mean, Jesus wouldn't want to take this from me. And I don't think Jesus is going to make the guy run around with no jacket. That's not the point. The point is we're clutching certain things that we feel are our security and our comfort and our protection. And sometimes those are the very things that prevent us from coming to Jesus. That we hold on to too tightly. I was reading a blog post by a friend of mine who's battling cancer. He's a remarkable uh, individual of faith. And he was saying... You know, I always would say things like, let go of everything else and hold tightly to Jesus. And he goes, now I know what that means because all those other things have taken away. But hold tightly to Jesus. And that's what Bartimaeus does. You know, when you think about it, there's so much stacked against this man coming to Jesus. There's his condition he can't see. He's blind. He's poor. He's a beggar. He's an outcast. There's the crowd trying to prevent him. There's probably his own voice of like, why would he stop for you? It's very unlikely this encounter would happen, but Jesus. He responds. Finally, faith follows Jesus. Now, we, we mentioned that faith moves the heart of Jesus. We see over and over again in the New Testament gospel accounts that Jesus responds to humble statements of faith. We see it in the Canaanite woman in the book of Matthew, where, where Jesus, who she's, not a, she's not a Jew, but she expresses great faith and trust, and Jesus praises her for it. Or the centurion, Jesus says, I have not seen such great faith in all of Israel. He's a Roman, for crying out loud. Or the faith of the four friends who bring their, their buddy who's the paralytic. Remember this story? They rip apart the roof. They let the him down. Jesus sees their faith. So Jesus is on the lookout for humble, authentic faith. And when he sees it, it moves his heart. But it doesn't just move God's heart. It's supposed to move ours as well. Faith is not just passive, certain things that you believe. Last week in worship, Anton was up here on stage and he said he wanted us all to raise our hands. And I saw some of you. You did like the T-Rex arms. How far? How far? I raise my hands, right, you know? And he said to us, if you're afraid of raising your hands, it's maybe because you have the fear of man. You're worried about what it looks like, right? Authentic faith moves us to follow, frees us from worry, being worried about what everybody else thinks. The way the story ends is so, so powerful for us. Let's look at the, how the story ends. Let's go to the last couple of verses. And Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? What a great question. What if he asked you that question? How would you answer it? Like, how, Bart, there's lots of options. He's a beggar. He could ask for food. 
He could ask for a home. He could ask Jesus to teach that, those mean people a lesson who pick on him all day. He's blind, so it makes sense that he'd ask for sight. But there's something more going on. He says, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. The implication is he once could see. He's probably not someone born blind, but lost his sight, whether due to disease, uh, illness, or injury. Let me ha bring back that which was lost. And in a way, this is a precursor to what Jesus will do to restore all lostness, to, to right every wrong. The book of Isaiah gives us a hint of this, of what's coming when Jesus writes all the wrong things and, and brings all these things back. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of deaf, the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. When the king comes, when the king returns. So he can see now. He asks Jesus that, to see. How would you answer the question? What do you want me to do for you? What would be the deepest, like the thing that you, deep inside that you want Jesus to do for you? Some of our answers might not be so, we'd be a little ashamed of. They're a little selfish. But it's worth asking that question of yourself. What would you say to Jesus? What do you want me to do for you? Maybe you'd say, well, I don't, I don't expect a perfect life, but you know, Jesus, I'm gonna try to be a good person and follow you, so I want a little something for the effort here. You know, do something. What is it you want from him? More importantly, what does he want for you? Bartimaeus says, help me recover that which was lost. I want to see. And the implication is he's talking about something deeper and more important than just physical sight. Because the physical miracles always point to the spiritual healing. Help me see. Okay, so he can see. Immediately, he recovered his sight. What is Bartimaeus going to do now that he can see? All, think of the options. I can get a job. I can travel the world. I can see the sights. I could never see them before. I mean, the possibilities are endless. Before, I could only sit here on the roadside begging for help. Now, I can do almost anything I want to do. And Jesus is remarkable. He says, go your way. Okay, you've been made well. Go your way. Live your life. What does he want now that he can see? We're told that he followed him on the way. These two words, I think, are important connection here. He followed him on the way. Do you know that the Christians in the book of Acts are called followers of the way over and over again? Paul in Acts 9, before he's Paul, he's Saul of Tarsus, who's persecuting Christians, trying to wipe out Christianity in the church. And he says that he's, he wants to uh, remove the followers of the way from Jerusalem. The way. So Jesus says, you are now free to go your way. And Bartimaeus, who can now see physically, says, I, I don't want to go my way. I've tried that. I want to go your way. I want to follow you, Jesus, on your way, on the way. True authentic faith doesn't just believe certain things intellectually. It moves us to say, I don't want to go my way. I want to go his way. I want to follow him. Of all the possibilities open to Bartimaeus, he says, I, I, all I want is to follow you. It's worth examining my own life and yours. Authentic faith. Sees without eyes. Focuses on Jesus. It's not faith in myself or the world or others. It perseveres in the face of opposition in a world that seems hostile to it, even when my own mind and heart seem to prevent me from, it perseveres, crying out. It moves God's heart, even the simple, humble cry of faith. And most importantly, it moves me, it moves you, it moves us to follow him, to become like him. By the way, the way, by the way, the way, Jesus is on his way to the cross. We're nearing the end of the Gospel of Mark. That's the way. The way he's going is to Jerusalem, to betrayal, to execution, to death, and ultimately to resurrection. Let's follow him on his way. We're gonna close the service by taking communion. So again, if you didn't receive the elements, I just, just let the ushers know and they'll come and give those to you. And I wanna say something to those of you who might be here for the first time, if you're visiting with us, if you're new, 
Um, this is not, you don't have to be a member of Chapel Street Church. You don't have to be a regular tender. Uh, this is not our table. This is, this is not our supper. It's the Lord's Supper. So if you're here and you've placed your trust in Jesus Christ, and you know him as your, the forgiver of your sin and the Lord of your life, doesn't mean you've got it all together, but you've placed your trust in Jesus and you're welcome at his table. Historically, one of the things that the church has done before coming to the table is to confess. Preparing our hearts by acknowledging our need. Like Bartimaeus, Lord have mercy on me. So let's, let's read this confession together. Most merciful God, I confess my unbelief. I confess my faithlessness. I have not trusted in your power to save, restore, heal, and protect. I have sinned against you, claiming I have no sin. Lord, make my heart humble and willing to say, I have sinned. Pardon, I ask. Pardon, I hope for. Pardon, I trust to have. Give me faith in you alone, Christ Jesus, the author and perfecter of my faith. The Bible tells us in 1 John 1, verse 9, that we, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. These simple elements of bread and cup we hold in our hands have been, this, down through the centuries, the way Christians, people of the way, have come together and been reminded of the great sacrifice of our Lord for us. So peel off that top layer. Take the bread. Jesus took bread and broke it and passed it to his disciples and said, this is my body. It is given for you. Take and eat. And after they had eaten, Jesus poured out a cup saying, this is the new covenant in my blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins. And every time we drink this, we proclaim his death and resurrection until he returns. Let's do that together. <laughs> 